We're talking today with Norman Spring of Grand Haven, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Norman, begin with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Ann Arbor. I have two uh, German parents. They uh, migrated or immigrated over here from uh, Germany in the 20, late 20s. Okay. My father was a uh, watchmaker, worked for a jewelry store in Ann Arbor. Okay. And, and what year were you born? I was born in October 13th, 1932. Okay. So, and did your family speak German at home? My mother spoke a lot of German. She had a lot of German friends in Ann Arbor, and uh, we had the old telephones at that time mm -hmm. on the wall, and uh, she would speak endlessly mm -hmm. in German to her German friends, and I picked up some German, and I, I could understand it very well, still can. Uh, and I spoke a little bit of it when I needed to, but I uh, didn't I purposely didn't learn German. Okay, and that said, so would your father, would your parents mostly speak to you in English when you were a kid? Always spoke to me in English. Okay. At, least, at least my father did. Mm -hmm. He spoke very good English. He uh, he made a point of it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, so you were, and then did you grow up in Ann Arbor? I grew up to be a till uh, my 17th year, which when I graduated from high school. Okay, so to back up a little bit now, so you're actually, you're living, when you're a little kid, the depression is on, um, you would have been still fairly young during the worst of it, but do you remember anything about life in the depression? I mean, was it, did your father have a hard time earning enough money, or? Well, my father, uh, Knew, had a lot of friends, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them were German friends that mm -hmm. had migrated over mm -hmm. here also. And uh, so he had contacts with food, like meat was mm -hmm. the big thing, you know, trying to get uh, get meat. And uh, he, he, uh, he knew German butchers and that sort of thing, and uh, he, uh, he never seemed to have any problem with money. Mm -hmm because he had a steady job mm -hmm. uh, but we do we did uh, uh, have uh, uh, shortages on, on rubber and that was for the war right right and I would hunt golf balls on a golf course not too far from our home and uh, I'd sell the good golf balls to, to the golfers and uh, and the bad ones, we I could take to uh, Cunningham store and get a dime a piece for them, and uh, so I got pocket. I mm -hmm. always had pocket money. <laughs> okay, all right. Now you're you're you would have been a kid during World War II. Uh, now was it a problem at all for you that your family was German, or were there enough German Americans around that it wasn't a big deal? Well, there was a lot of German Americans around, and we even had a. A, what they call the Schwaben Verein, which was a uh, organization in in Ann Arbor. They owned a building and had a dance floor on top with a bar, which they used, mm -hmm. and a, a regular bar downstairs, and they got in uh, income from that. Mm -hmm. But the upstairs they had. Uh, on a regular basis, they used to have German parties, and I mean often, and, uh, and so it was. It, I grew up with that. <laughs> Did they continue to have German parties during the war? Just right through the war. Right yeah. Through the war. Okay. And they even had a, a picnic grounds that they used to go to and have uh, uh, beer parties out there mm -hmm. and uh, food. You know, always a lot of food. All right, okay. Uh, now, do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I remember Pearl Harbor uh, as it happened. And uh, well, I can't say that uh, anything special happened uh, around Ann Arbor mm -hmm. as a result of it, but uh, I remember uh, Roosevelt 
declaring that uh, his famous speech that we've been invaded and, and we are now at war with uh, Japan. And did your parents or the German community have any response when the U.S. went to war against Germany? No, not really. My, my mother was, uh, had mixed emotions, of course. She had, she had a big family in, in uh, Germany, mm -hmm. and um, some of her family uh, was in the war. My father was in World War I in the German Navy, in the submarines of all things. Wow. <laughs> but not long, it was mm -hmm. toward the end of the war. And, uh, and he was also an athlete, uh, quite a runner and a gymnast. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now how did he respond to the war starting? I didn't. I, I never uh, got a feeling of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they didn't. I mean, you, you would have been pretty young. They didn't really talk about the Nazis or anything like that. Not really, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so you, you're too you're too young for for all of that. Uh, and, and so then, what year did you graduate from high school? So I was seventeen, in 1950. Okay. And then, what did you do once you graduated from high school? Well, the very night that I graduated, I hitchhiked up north uh, to the Upper Peninsula and across, across the country all the way out to Montana. I, can, I, I, hitched, I got out to Montana in three days okay. by hitchhiking. All right. And what led you to do that? I guess I just uh, wanderlust, I guess. But I... Uh, I uh, got a job in Montana, and uh, it was with a uh, kind of a catch-all service station that did everything. Mm -hmm. They served food, and they sold gasoline, and, and they, uh, they had uh, chickens for themselves, and they, they had rental cabins, and I mentioned they just did everything. Mm -hmm. And I helped them do that. Uh, I was just an overall uh, handyman. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a, a young Indian who was about my age. And uh, the, uh, the guy that hired me that from this place uh, told me, he says, don't tell the Indian how much I'm paying you because I'm not paying him as much as I'm paying you. Okay. And uh, which was fifty dollars a month, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, in, in in silver dollars, always paid in silver dollars, which make it walk in a circle. <laughs> All right. So how long did you stay there? Uh, I stayed there. Let's see, well over a month, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I used to even ride with that Indian boy. He always rode uh, bareback, and he gave me a horse that was uh, I had to get on bareback, and he rode like the wind. And I, you know, I had to hang on to the mane mm -hmm. and just the bridle, and uh, he'd jump over ditches and things like that. And it was it was quite exciting. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then I then I quit there. And I, uh, I, I went to uh, Many Glacier Hotel, which was just north. This is, this is Browning, Montana, mm -hmm. where I was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was right at, it was called Kiowa Junction. And uh, the junction was one uh, road went north and one went west. And he was right at that junction mm -hmm. uh, to do everything. And uh, so I went up to, uh, Many Glacier Hotel, and I got a job in the laundry, and uh, mostly college kids worked at that uh, mm -hmm. hotel. And uh, we had a uh, we had a lot of fun up there. Uh, as you know, it's just a social kind of thing. But one time, another boy and myself and two girls 
decided to get some beer, but you couldn't get it in, in Glacier Park because that was still within the Indian Reservation and there was no alcohol mm -hmm. sold in the, within the Indian Reservation. So we hitchhiked over the to what they call it, the Tucson Highway. Uh, it was over the top and, and down to the next town, I think was in Idaho. And we bought a case of beer. And we were hitchhiking back and we got picked up by three Indians with a new Chevy uh, coupe. And uh, they had uh, got a satchel full of uh, uh, booze themselves and they were drinking on it, drinking it on the way back and uh, the more they drank the faster they went and, and on top of the mountain they were uh, kind of uh, skidding around the mountain. It was kind of spooky. Mm -hmm. In fact it scared the girls so much that they actually got down on the floor <laughs> and uh, the, the Indians handed uh, a bottle back to us once in a while, the, the other guy and myself, we took a snort of it. <laughs> when they'd get through with the bottle, they'd throw it out the window and smash it on a, on a rock wall. But we got over, uh, we got back to our, our place that we were working and uh, it, was, uh, it was a little bit amazing. Uh, <laughs> that, and I told that to a a bus driver Indian, it was called Jeremiah, and his, he, uh, I told him that story, he says, those are probably my uncles. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, it was, uh, then I hitched, I, uh, I left the hotel, I just quit, and they didn't, of course, they didn't, nobody likes it when you just up and quit, mm -hmm. but I, uh, you know, that was my time and I was going to do what I wanted to do and I hitchhiked out of town, uh, down through Browning and, and I, I got, a, got a ride by a, uh, an old guy and his bitchy wife and, uh, and a tag along kid, an eight year old in the back seat and I rode with them. And, got into Yellowstone Park and they had a trailer that they were pulling, a small trailer, and they stayed in that door and they said that they, I could stay in the car, mm -hmm. sleep in the car overnight, which I did. It was colder in Yellow, and, and Yellowstone that time of the year. And, uh, and I got up early one morning and I had a roll of fishing line, black fishing line and a, a daredevil, a, a black and white daredevil. And I went to the fishing bridge, which we were parked next to, and I lowered this line with this daredevil, and I kind of twitched it a few times, and I got a real nice big cutthroat trout, and uh, I had her for breakfast. She cooked it for mm -hmm. me. And uh, But then we toured the park, and uh, the old guy told me one time, he says, well, it's just the two of us by, by ourselves. He said, uh, he says, you know, when I get back to New Jersey or wherever they lived, he says, I'm going to divorce her. <laughs> I'm getting tired of her. And uh, he said, I'll tell you what, he says, what you ought to do and don't get married. He says, find the biggest whore in town and, and, and hang out with her. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we uh, we traveled a while and uh, on a, going back mm -hmm. toward uh, Michigan, and uh, and I said, you know, I think I can get a little, make a little better time on my own. I said, I'm going to leave you people. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't stand uh, his wife's bitching all the time, and, and uh, so anyhow. They let me out and took off and, well, I got a truck ride and, uh, and this is in Wyoming and uh, the truck driver stopped in the middle of a plains and he says, I got to turn here. 
I says, where are you going? Says, I'm going that way. He's going to go across the plains. I, and I had, so I was stuck there in the middle of uh, Wyoming, and I thought, what the heck? I've got my map out and try to figure out where I was. I was about 60 miles from the nearest town. <laughs> and uh, so I was standing there for the longest time, and I thought, boy, <laughs> and I walked a while, wore the handle off my, my I lit a little suitcase, mm -hmm. and I wore that off, and I carried it on my shoulder, and I'd stop every now and then and rest. And, and finally, uh, a guy came whizzing by me, and, and uh, he uh, stopped about a mile down the road, and he backed all the way up, just he and his wife. He said, I had to look you over first before I was going to pick you up. So mm -hmm. he's, he says, where are you going? I says, back to Michigan. He says, well, I'm going to Wisconsin. He said, I'll give you a ride that far, uh, which was <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, pretty good, and so we uh, we we traveled uh, on that route for a while, and, and I got to Wisconsin, and he took me all the way down to uh, to the uh, Milwaukee Clipper, which is still parked up on Muskegon, and uh, I got a ride. I took a ride across the Milwaukee Clipper to uh, Michigan or Muskegon. And then I hitchhiked back up to Mackinac Island. I had uh, high school friends up there that lived with their parents on the island in the summer. And uh, they had their own home, uh, horses and everything. Mm -hmm. And so we'd ride around horseback and uh, it was, I had, a, I stayed up there a week. And then I hitchhiked back down to Ann Arbor finally and I got, I got there and uh, I went to work for Argus Camera Company, which is defunct now, but uh, at that time they made uh, a lot of cameras. And uh, I worked there for uh, in a packaging uh, department where I made boxes with another guy about my age. And so that was, that was kind of a fun job. Uh, it was easy. And, uh, so eventually, uh, I was done with that job by, I guess I just quit. And uh, I decided to uh, go in the service because when I was in uh, Montana and Kiowa Junction, uh, the Korean War had just started mm -hmm. and the people didn't have inside radios and they'd go out their car and turn their car radio on and, and listen because they were invading uh, and the North Koreans were invading South Korea. So they're trying to keep up with the news mm -hmm. and uh, well, so I knew the Korean War was on and I thought, well, I'll, I'll volunteer for the service and, uh, and uh, I first went to the Marines. I thought, well, that's a you know, it's a, a reputable outfit. And I said, how long is the service for, can I enlist for? And he said, well, it, it has to be for the duration of the war. I said, well, I didn't like that. I could last 10 years, you know, and I, I'm not going to do that. So I did the same thing with the, or with the Navy and the Air Force, and they were four years apiece that I had to enlist for. And then I went to the Army, and that was only three years. I said, well, I'll take that. And uh, so I volunteered for the uh, Army Airborne, which is... Uh, okay. So when did you actually enlist? In February of uh, 1954. Oh, to enlist. That would have been 51, probably. Excuse me, 51. Yeah. Yeah. 51. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Because 54 is when you, that would have been actually when your hitch would have ended if you had done the whole, yeah. but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. So you, you enlisted there. Now, had you received a draft notice? I, I hadn't gotten a draft notice okay. yet. And had you... See, I was, I just, uh, just turned 18 by mm -hmm. that time. Right. Okay. Uh, and there are 
they're ramping up the draft at that point, but you yeah. enlisted before they caught up with you. Yeah. Okay. Now, at that point, had you given any thought to going to college? I did, but I was not a good student in high school, and I, uh, and I thought, well, college is not for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I went in the service, okay. and then, I, of course, I spent my three years in the service before I actually it was not quite three years, but uh, then I went to, uh, then I started going to college. Okay. All right, so you go back. So um, February 51, you enlist, um, and once you sign up, what happens to you? Well, they, uh, you got to report to a certain location, and uh, mine was Fort Sugar in Illinois, okay. which I ended up in. Uh, come when I came back from uh, overseas, uh, but Fort Sheridan, Illinois, which is uh, which they call a repo depot. They transfer, mm -hmm. take people in, transfer them out. Yeah, because that's so. You did you do your physical there and that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and about how long did you stay there? Well, not very long. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe a week, okay. and uh, then I, they transferred me down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is a, uh, uh, the, the, the 11th Airborne, which I uh, was in. And uh, the very first day I got to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the, uh, a major took all of us new guys out to the drop zone where, where they were practicing jumping. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were standing there watching and they come out in what they call sticks. Uh, I think it's 18 people to a stick on both sides of the plane, one, one on each side, or a stick on each side. And on, on our side, the, a guy got uh, hung up on the side of the plane and he was banging against the plane and he managed to get him loose and he, he had to pull his uh, emergency because his chute was screwed up and mm -hmm. uh, but he he made it to the ground and I understand that uh, he got banged up or broke his back or something like that and uh, and then he said you'll never see that again well the very next plane had another stick a guy jumped out and he had a, what they call a Roman candle. His chute didn't open. It was twisted up and he fell all the way to the ground and uh, of course died and they, were, they ran a jeep out there and picked him up. And the major said, to you, we're going back. To the <laughs> <laughs> so we went back to the, to the barracks and uh, so I was in Fort Campbell for a while, and, and uh, uh, my father uh, had a good friend who was in the Airborne and, and uh, convinced him to come down to Kentucky and talk me into quitting the Airborne because he says, you know, never get out of that once you get in it. He says, you know, anyhow, my dad came, made a special trip, which was unusual for him. And uh, we went in uh, Nashville and saw the Grand Ole Opry and that kind of thing. But uh, he talked me into quitting the Airborne. And so I, it was the hardest thing I ever did. And uh, I did. And uh, then I volunteered for combat infantry and uh, took that right there at Fort Campbell. And, uh, All right, now, um, how far had you gotten into your basic training at Fort Campbell before uh, your father came just down? about ready to start jumping out of the airplane. Okay. And once you do that, you're, you're, you're in. Okay, now, did you have a regular basic training at Fort Campbell while you were still in the Airborne, or did they immediately start? Oh, right there. But because normally a jump school comes after after the basic, basic. training. Okay. And so did you do basic 
at Fort Campbell yeah. while you were still planning on becoming a paratrooper? Yeah. Okay. All right. So describe a little bit what basic training was like. Well, basic training was uh, quite vigorous. Uh, the, uh, the Airborne and uh, Marines always consider themselves the ultimate. Up. And uh, the guys used to say that uh, one Airborne guy can take on uh, any ten of the other guys, mm -hmm. you know. It was just, uh, but of course, uh, there was a lot of just bull. bull. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we did a lot of, uh, of push-ups, a lot of running, and a lot of drinking at, at nighttime, and uh, beer, just beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember uh, uh, what they used to do is a uh, sergeant would uh, notice something unusual that, that you did, and he'd say, hit it for 25 push-ups. And, uh, and after a while, I'd say, I'll do uh, 50 if you'll do them with me. And, uh, and then they got kind of leery about picking on me. <laughs> I, I got it all the way up to 75, and, uh, and they didn't bother me anymore. And uh, when we would go out to uh, the uh, bar on, right, it was right on base, I, the guys would just, just scarf the, the beer down. And of course, I wasn't used to that, but I would drink it. And I, I remember I, I, my head hit the bar and I slumped to the floor and, and the sergeant said, take him back to the barracks. And so they, a couple of guys took me back to the barracks and threw me in a bunk. And, and uh, when they all got back, the sergeant said, we're going to go for a run. And, uh, and of course, the only guy that didn't come out was me because I, <laughs> I was out. And they said, get Spring out here. And uh, they stood me up in line and I collapsed and they said, take him back inside. They ran on a 12 mile run that night. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty unhappy with me because I missed it all. <laughs> yeah. Now was this all still while you were just in basic? Yeah, this so is all in basic. Because okay. I guess it's, it sounds, seems unusual that they were allowing the new recruits to drink. Because I'm, no I'm, sure, I'm not sure I've ever heard that story before, but that's why we do interviews. Okay. They All did right. a lot so, of drinking. Yeah. And maybe because they were airborne, they just had their own rules. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, regardless, so you were, now when you were training with those guys, um, was everybody white or were there any black or Hispanic uh, troopers? We didn't have blacks in the yeah. service at that, in that year. Uh, it wasn't until 1950. Three, I think, either 52 or 53 yeah. that they uh, integrated uh, blacks into the white service. Okay, because actually Truman, President Truman had officially desegregated the military in the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. uh, and some units had black soldiers in earlier than that. But the units that you were with, you were not serving with black soldiers until 53. No, no blacks. Yeah, okay. They yeah. did have their own uh, units. Yeah. Okay, but there were some units that were integrated by then, and the Air Force was more integrated, but there were different things in different places. But that's kind of why I asked, because it went incrementally. Yeah. So some before others. So in your case, you did not see any yet. Okay. Um, now, but then you said you, you stopped your airborne training. Uh, how do you do that, by the way? Do you just go into an office someplace and say, I don't want to be airborne? I said, I'm quitting. Okay. <laughs> they said, why? I said, it's a bunch of bullshit. And uh, they took me into the officer, the main officer, and stood me in front of him, and, and uh, he asked me the same questions. I said, uh, I'm quitting, and he said, why? I said, it's, it's all a bunch of bullshit. And one of the, the non-coms said, uh, well, don't put that in there. He says, put it in there. Just just like that. <laughs> so that was the end of that. Okay. And that, that was as simple as that. All right. Uh, now, did you go at that point to um, infantry advanced training, or did you go to ba boot camp? What was I had, basic all over I, again? I was reassigned to what they call an arm artist for a, 
I took care of the arms. Okay. But I was training in the process. So I mean that was in addition to uh, the arms. Uh, that was just part time kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so did you get did you get uh, specialized infantry training? Specialized, yeah. 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 Okay. So you did get that, and were you able to do that at Fort Campbell? At Fort Campbell. Okay. Uh, so when did you finish that training? Well, let's see, I'm trying to think of when I went over to uh, overseas, uh, that would have been in, might have been in September uh, yeah. that I uh, went overseas and I, I took a train across the country. Uh, I was, I had, I had military gear and uh, with the full intention of going right to Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put us on, a, they had only prop planes at that time, and they put us on a plane in Los Angeles and uh, uh, flew to Wake Island and refueled and then to uh, uh, Hawaii and refueled. Probably Hawaii would have come first. Hawaii first and yeah. then Wake right. Island yeah. and uh, refueled at those places and uh, and then uh, landed in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, when I was uh, landed in Japan there I think there were 30 of us that had been in uh, I don't know if we were all in the airborne or what but they decided to uh, just put us in the military police, you know, they just do whatever they want with you, and, mm -hmm. and that's, so I ended up in the military police. Okay, so what unit were you assigned to then? The 8th Army Stockade is what it was called. Okay, and can you explain what that was? Well, a stockade was a prison, and, uh, uh, and being a military policeman, I, uh, I was assigned uh, to a prison chaser, as I related earlier, and the, uh, a prison chaser would transfer prisoners from the stockade to either the hospital or wherever else they were assigned to go. And I would, I would handcuff them to my left side and uh, and we'd ride in, a, I'd carry a 45 on my right side, and we would uh, take a taxi or a bus to wherever. If they had to go to the hospital and get an operation, I'd go in the operating room with them and stand there and watch. And, uh, but, that, but that was my job. Right. I even got assigned one time to a, uh, one of the uh, prisoner of war died and uh, Japanese and uh, he was in the morgue and um, I was assigned to be there with him because they they couldn't release uh, the prisoners until the family took them mm -hmm. and uh, they gave me uh, an autopsy and I stood there watching that autopsy and then I was I had to be there all night long in that in that morgue <laughs> with that uh, prisoner. <laughs> okay. Now, what uh, so what kinds of prisoners were held in the stockade? Well, there were uh, a lot of officers, mostly. Okay, American or Japanese? And, well, I'm talking about Japanese. Yeah. Okay. And uh, but the uh, the Americans were. Well, just regular soldiers that, in one case I transferred, uh, he, he had committed murder, you know, and, uh, uh, but he was just a regular soldier. And, uh, but the, uh, the Japanese were, like I say, mostly officers. Okay. And why were they in the stockade? Why were they prisoners? Prisoners of war. Okay. Well, by this time, most convention... This was still uh, occupation. Right. 
But at this point, I think most normal POWs would have been released. But why were they still in prison? Were they war criminals or? They were war criminals. Okay. Um, one of them was a vice admiral of the Japanese Navy. Spoke very good English. In fact, he took a uh, uh, went to school in the United States, and uh, and he he had a great sense of humor. He said, "I don't know why they made me a, a war criminal." He says, "Every time I sent a ship out, they sunk it." <laughs> and but very smart person. I mm -hmm. used to enjoy talking with him. In fact, I taught him how to play chess, and he beat me on my second game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, and if he was in charge of something like transferring prisoners or things like that, that might be the kind of thing that would count as a war crime. Regular command, who knows? But but you don't know enough about his case to know what his situation was. No. no only that he spoke good English, could play good chess. Okay. Right. What's the uh, what's the war criminals uh, could speak English? Mm -hmm. Okay. And were they at that point just serving sentences? They were, all, all, were they already convicted war criminals and they yeah. were serving their sentences? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, now, how long did you have that job? I was there uh, in Japan for a year and a half. Okay. All right. And, uh, uh, but th then I volunteered for Korea again. All right. Let's talk a little bit. You, you spent a year and a half in Japan. That's kind of a long time. Um, what, where did you live while you were in Japan? Did you stay on base or somewhere else? I stayed at the uh, Eighth Army uh, Hospital. Mm -hmm. That hospital was built in 1923 because of the earthquake in Japan mm -hmm. by the Americans and uh, the uh, for the uh, Japanese. Mm -hmm. And anyhow, they uh, I I lived there at that hospital uh, in the prison ward mostly, mm -hmm. and uh, or adjacent to it. Because I think in the original interview we had done with you, you mentioned um, being out in the countryside or with a Japanese family or something like that. That comes next. Okay. <laughs> well, because well, I asked where you'll say, so how long did you stay, live, then stay at the hot, live at the hospital, or live at the prison, rather? Well, a year and a half. Okay. 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 So that was all. Now, while you were had that duty, would you go into, you know, in, into? Go I traveled all over Japan. Okay. I, uh, I uh, took the the trains were very efficient. You could you could get on a train anywhere, and and uh, uh, they they I mean you get to your location and uh, on time, and uh, it was just it was really easy to travel around Japan mm -hmm. on train. And that's the only way I travel mostly, and uh, but I I took in a lot of sites. I did I did some hunting and fishing, and and uh, I would uh, take the train and and hire a guide or something like that, and uh, for fishing or hunting or whatever. And uh, I even ran into a, a high school friend of mine. Uh, over there, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the two of us uh, went duck hunting together one time. <laughs> okay. And how did the Japanese uh, get along with the American soldiers? They were very polite. They, uh, we, uh, as far as I could tell, there never was there was never a problem, mm -hmm. and uh, they were very good to us. And, uh, when I had volunteered for uh, Korea again, I was granted uh, to go, but I also asked for a, a week's furlough, which was very unusual at that time mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, the, to give anybody a furlough. But since I was going to Korea, they they had granted a, a furlough, so I asked a, a Japanese barber on our base where I could go pheasant hunting and uh, and stay and uh, he uh, he wrote a letter in Japanese and uh, gave it to me he said go to this town 
and he says, get off the train and hand, hand the letter to somebody, and, uh, which is what I did, and they um, ushered me to another location, and, and finally up, a, up on top of this uh, ridge, and uh, there was a nice farmhouse there, and I handed this uh, letter to uh, the mama-san, and uh, <laughs> and uh, she invited me in, and uh, and then he, she introduced me to her husband, who was a uh, World War II uh, veteran. And uh, the only picture they had on the wall was of him in uniform. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, they both treated me very well. He hired a guide with two. English pointers to to, uh, to take me pheasant hunting, and the arrangement was that I would stay with these people, and uh, at night time we'd sleep on the floor. It was just a, a straw floor, roll a mat out a, a lengthwise, and everybody would sleep on the mat, and uh, I'd be on the end. And and uh, for eating, they had a uh, hole on the floor and everybody sat with their feet in the hole and a hibachi uh, that uh, was a charcoal burner mm -hmm. and uh, that's what they'd cook over and, uh, and, you, and you'd eat right there with, a, with your food on a plate and uh, your food was uh, cooked and served right, right there. And then the Japanese uh, guide would pick me up at daybreak every morning. In the meantime, the uh, Pampasan would uh, make a sandwich for me, and give it to the guide and put it in his pack sack, and we'd go hunting for the day. And during the day, or uh, middle of the day, we uh, would stop by a stream and a guide would make a little fire and, and make some tea and uh, get our sandwiches out and we'd sit by the, the fire and drink tea and eat our sandwiches. And one time I was observing in the, the, the stream and I noticed a trout would, had, was swimming in there and he went in to, uh, with his head kind of in through, uh, pointed into the rocks I was managed to grab him and catch him, and it was a, a good size uh, trout that I uh, that I cleaned, and I uh, made a willow branch and cooked him over the fire, and the and the guy got a real big kick out of that. We were pheasant hunting, and uh, I'd catch fish and, and eat them. <laughs> but at the uh, I, I when we'd come back. I take my pheasants. I had pheasants. I had grouse. I had woodcock, and uh, I, I even think I had some doves. But uh, but I give them to the papasan, and he'd clean them, mm -hmm. and he'd wipe them out with newspaper, and then he'd hang them on the outside of the building. And I had quite a bunch by the time at the end of the week, hanging on the outside of the building, but. Uh, they wanted me to take them, and I insisted they keep them. And uh, they uh, they were really, I mean, all week they were really good to me. Mm -hmm. And they followed me down to the train and waved handkerchiefs as I left. And I, I thought that was pretty neat. <laughs> oh. All right. Now, uh, just to back up a little bit, why did you want to go to Korea? Crazy. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I don't have a good excuse for that. It was just an adventure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, at that point, now you're getting, so when do you actually go to Korea? When do you get there? I got to um, another, what they call repo depot, which mm -hmm. we explained earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, it was an Air Force base, and uh, I got to that point in uh, February, was it? No, no, it was January. No, it wasn't January, it was December, the end of mm -hmm. December. And uh, uh, 
and I was to go to Korea the next day, and I don't know if there was how many days I was at that location, I got right off and I can't remember. But uh, New Year's Eve came while we were there, and uh, the first sergeant of the, that place came out and said, nobody gets any passes tonight, unless you've got a relative on the island. Well, I call a friend of mine down in uh, Tokyo that I worked with down there, and I said, call a sergeant and tell him that you're my brother and uh, we want to pass for tonight and get a go out tonight. So he did, and, and a sergeant called me out and gave me a pass, and so we went to a non-commissioned officer's uh, club and, and drank champagne until we got boozled. <laughs> And came back, and uh, I came back late, and, uh, and the guard said, you're late. And I said, oh, I got lost. And uh, anyhow, yeah. the next day I went to Korea. Yeah. What would they do, send you to Korea at that point? You know, so Not much they could do to you there. No, yeah, okay. definitely. Before we leave Japan entirely, were there particular places that you visited in Japan that stand out in your memory? Well, there were... Uh, there were a lot of sushi places uh, downtown uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I had a good friend from uh, uh, Kentucky. No, it was yeah, I think he was from Kentucky. But anyhow, he he and I used to take our time off and go down to one of these sushi places and drink uh, sai beer for uh, the afternoon and and uh, have sushi and. Uh, and just talk, and that would that'd be an afternoon for us. <laughs> but that was that was one of the places. Then they also had dance places that uh, uh, we'd go to, and uh, it was kind of sort of like a nightclub. Mm -hmm. They uh, usually had a lot of trouble. <laughs> Did you kind of um, stay away from riskier activities? You know, a lot of men carried on with Japanese women, or there were all kinds of other things like that. Well, when I, uh, a lot of guys that uh, in, the, in my outfit, they would get what they call a musume, a, a girl, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they just call them mooses. A musume was a young lady, mm -hmm. and uh, so they would get their moose, and they'd get a, a, a shack. And they'd live in a shack, just like husband and mm -hmm. wife. Or, and they'd give uh, their money to the, the moose, and she'd get the groceries and take care of the place. And mm -hmm. uh, they never went anywhere. So I traveled all mm -hmm. the time, and I took a lot of pictures. And uh, they would ask me for pictures so they could send home what <laughs> Japan looked like. That. <laughs> now, I didn't get a moose of me. Okay. Uh, did you go to places like Mount Fuji or Kyoto or the other tourist Mount sites? Mount Fuji was, uh, was close by, mm -hmm. and it had a golf course at its base. And uh, I played golf on, on, that, uh, on that golf course. No Japanese could play it at that mm -hmm. time because it was still during occupation. And I was one of very few people on the whole course. Now it's a million dollars just to belong to it. And, uh, but I'd go to other places like Hakone, and, uh, uh, which is a uh, northern island. And uh, I went to uh, Oshima Island, which is about six hours out in the ocean. And I hunted pheasants out there and stayed there for a while. And, uh, but I did a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So I go back. So you, you get to Korea. Um, did you go to Korea on New Year's Day or January 2nd or? I got to, uh, uh, we left on New Year's Day. Okay. And, uh, I got, went through, uh, uh, well, did you go to, by boat or by plane? Hmm? Did you go by boat or by plane? We, we, uh, flew over. Okay. Okay. And I, I got to, uh, I'm trying to think of that. Name of the main island, I mean, I mean a port that I. Well, Pusan uh, is in the uh, south, or Incheon. 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 Okay. Uh, I, I I went to Incheon, mm -hmm. and uh, 
and they uh, <laughs> they wanted to put me in the Marines again. Marines I'm not in the Marines, in the uh, MPs. MP. Yeah. And uh, I said, I don't. I've already been. Uh, and then I said, I I want to go to the front line. And uh, and they said, well, that's a bit unusual. <laughs> and uh, they, most people want to go the other direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, are you the only son? I said, I am. And uh, said, well, it's against our best judgment, but we'll see. you'll be on the front line tonight. So I was, and uh, then I was assigned to uh, the uh, 31st Infantry, 7th Division, mm -hmm. and uh, and I just traveled with that group uh, from uh, we we went on a patrol, uh, night patrol mostly. And uh, we stayed in bunkers, and uh, uh, we fought mostly at nighttime. A lot of shelling going on on both sides. I was adjacent to uh, Pork Chop Hill. It was like closer than from here to the pier, and uh, and a lot closer, about half as distance. But uh, anyhow, the. Uh, that was invaded, you probably uh, have read about. They even made a movie on Porkchop Hill with Gregory Peck. And uh, they would invaded that hill night and day. And uh, we had what they call moonbeams from the rear, huge spotlights. And they'd shine them on hills on the, in that area so that uh, they would light up the pork chop, and uh, then they would also drop flares from small planes to keep it all lit up. So you could actually, uh, night and day, you could read a newspaper uh, for a week. Okay. Uh, it was always lit up. In the meantime, while they were uh, charging that hill, for some reason the uh, North Koreans wanted that pork chop. And uh, they, within there, they knew that the, the armistice was going to happen, and but they wanted that with to, uh, to own it. Mm -hmm. And uh, within that constant invasion of that hill, they also invaded our hill. I was on Westview Outpost, which was adjacent, and they were, uh, and we uh, we fought them off at, uh, in our hill. But it wasn't it wasn't as rapid as as theirs. They they killed many many uh, invaders, and uh, of course a lot of the guys uh, the uh, Americans were killed in the process. Okay. Uh, now describe physically what did that area look like? I mean, when you're in your bunker and you look out, what do you see? Well, there was a lot of up and down hills. I've got a picture over there of the adjacent uh, where I was. Uh, and they, uh, they were all hills. And uh, we had uh, trenches in, uh, on our hill. And trenches uh, would be around the top of the hill. And, uh, and then they made bunkers uh, facing out uh, for defense. Was there any vegetation or was it all bare? Uh, there was a lot of tree stumps, and uh, they, uh, they, at one time there was quite a bit of vegetation, but most of it was blown away, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, there was uh, mostly dirt. Okay, all right, and um, the, it was probably mostly Chinese that you were fighting at that point, because I remember a lot of North Koreans left, but uh, with the Chinese attack at night? They were... Uh, they were very efficient uh, fighters because they stayed there all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas our uh, our guys were transferred in and out. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't spend much time, so they weren't con really conditioned very good. So they weren't nearly the uh, capability uh, when they were out in the open mm -hmm. uh, to sneak and so forth and. Uh, when we'd go on patrols, uh, it was noticeable with some of the guys within our patrol that just uh, clumsy, you know. And, and uh, I, I, I was uh, usually uh, either at the front or at the end, back 
the last guy to uh, in the patrol. And uh, in fact, one of the officers told me on when you uh, confront the enemy and some of our guys start running, shoot them. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to shoot any of our guys. <laughs> That's out of the question. Okay. When you patrolled, would you patrol at night or during the day? Always at night time. Okay. And did it help you at all that, that you were an experienced hunter? Did you have any skills or instincts? It really helped me a lot, yeah. yeah. Was, first of all, I was a good rifleman and, and, I, and, uh, and I, I had stealth. Okay. Um, now, when the Chinese attacked, would they attack you at night? Always. Okay. And was there a pattern to it? What would happen if no, they... No, there was no pattern to it. It was very unusual. That's my phone. It okay. just makes noise. All right. Okay. But uh, that's... Uh, there was no pattern. You couldn't, you couldn't count on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'd try to sneak in. I, I was a, a squad leader, and... Uh, I had uh, my squad would be uh, in in different uh, uh, outposts, mm -hmm. uh, lookout uh, bunkers, and what I would do is uh, go around and check them every now and then, just move in. But I'd always walk with uh, my 45 in my hand in the trench, and uh, and I approach the uh, the. Uh, bunker and I'd talk to them and sometimes I'd be too quiet and I'd scare them and uh, I didn't, <laughs> which I didn't intend to do. But, uh, okay, uh, when the Chinese attacked, did they use artillery or mortars or just on foot? They, uh, they would call in uh, artillery uh, and, uh, and lob it in just outside of our, our trenches and uh, but sometimes it would go off it was an uh, aerial burst right above mm -hmm. us scare the bejeebies out of us you know and of course if you're unlucky enough you could be hit, be hit by the shrapnel yeah. now was this Chinese artillery or was this our artillery ours okay and uh, the uh, Japanese would quite often throw mortars first mm -hmm. and they would go off and all around the places that they we had uh, listening posts off off of the uh, out of the bunkers. Mm -hmm. There were foxholes, and, and we'd always carry a, a wire line for communication mm -hmm. down to the foxhole. Well, they never uh, collected those wire lines, and so you'd almost have a black streak going right to the foxhole. Well, they could see that, mm -hmm. and uh, they'd drop them. Well, I can remember uh, being in a foxhole and mortars dropping all around me, and I, I just I can't believe that I didn't get hit, <laughs> dead center. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, uh, yeah, the dirt would fall on you, and some of the shrapnel would fall on you. But uh, uh, we would, uh, we had several listening posts outside. Mm -hmm. And I remember another time I was on a listening post, uh, just sitting on the ground, and at nighttime. This is all at nighttime, and uh, and I spotted a guy creeping along the ridge right above me, and I put my uh, uh, carbine on him, and uh, I was about ready to take the slack out of the trigger, and and uh, then I decided I'd talk to him. And I talked to him, and it was an American. I said, "Get the back, get back in that hole." I said, "You don't belong up there." And uh, anyhow, that, that was that was too close for comfort. Mm -hmm. I did shooting one of our own guys. Yeah. How I mean, how did the Jap did the China the Japanese did the Chinese ever get uh, close to taking your position, or how close would they get to your bunker line when they attacked? Well, right outside of our apertures, mm -hmm. they'd, they'd be there. But, but we did, we had a lot of firepower, mm -hmm. and uh, you could hear them talking out there, yelling at each other, and uh, in Japanese, obviously. Or Chinese, and I not guess. Japanese, but Chinese. Yeah. Okay, so they would get that close, but they wouldn't stay. They were no, no, <laughs> we 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 kept them, we okay. kept them away. Uh, 
And we just uh, had machine guns, and uh, I had grenades mm -hmm. uh, that I could flip out there, and then of course a rifle. And uh, but they, uh, they, 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 they were as close to their inside of this house. Okay. Now, when you were um, then in Korea with the 7th Division, did you basically stay up at the front lines all the time, or would they rotate you in and out? They would, uh, they'd give us a break every now and then, uh, a three-day break, uh, which was, they called their R&R. &R. Mm. Some guys got to go back to Japan, but uh, I got a three-day R&R, went off the front line, and it was a tent in the rear. They had all the food you could eat, all the ice cream you could eat, and all the sleep that you wanted. And that's all you did. Yeah. Sleep and eat. Yeah, well, how did you, what, what were sleeping and eating like when you were up there on the front line? Well, we got sea rations when we were on the front line. It came in a box, about like that. And uh, you had. Um, a can of beans in there, a can of, uh, I can't, if they had more than one can, usually one can of something. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't have to be beans, it might have been different things, but uh, uh, they'd have some uh, uh, crackers and cheese uh, wrapped in, wrapped up, and uh, they always had a little pack of cigarettes in there, every mm -hmm. pack, every uh, sea ration pack. And I didn't smoke, so I'd give them to somebody else, and uh, they might give me their crackers and cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but we had we had can openers that, and I still got mine from the front line. That uh, there were little tiny things like this. So you mm -hmm. open them like that. Have you seen one? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It was a P something. Uh, yeah. There's a particular name for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But they're very efficient, mm -hmm. and they. Uh, and you open your can with that, and uh, if you're lucky enough, you get some heat tabs. There were little tabs about like that, and... Uh, All right. We were talking about trying to eat up on the front lines in, in, in Korea. Well, I said we had a knife, fork, and spoon, but I, I, the only thing that was useful was a spoon. And uh, what I did is... Uh, take the, the handle of the spoon and, and twist it over a snap-on and I would uh, I'd clip it to my belt so I always had my spoon mm -hmm. next to me and uh, and when we get through uh, eating we just lick it clean and that that'd be the end of it mm -hmm. <laughs> and what kind of how would you sleep when you're up in the front lines did you we had uh, bunks that uh, were made out of communication wire and uh, uh, tree posts that uh, that framed uh, uh, kind of a bunk, and uh, and just communication wire. Mm -hmm. Would that be inside the bunkers? Inside the bunkers, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember one time when we were inside a bunker, there were three of us in there, and uh, usually at daybreak uh, the fighting had it all finished, but. It got daylight, and uh, uh, we we're about ready to get up, and three mortars went off, one after another, and right on the on the outside of our bunker, it knocked a hole, knocked the side of the wall off, and uh, uh, there was just all kinds of dust in the, in the room, and uh, and everybody was quiet, and they were wondering if. You know, one of them was a hit or not, mm -hmm. yeah, because there was a lot of three 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 mortars, and uh, uh, nobody got hit, and uh, just cleared the air with a, it was just dust, and uh, well, we repaired the bunker, obviously, mm -hmm. when we got through. Another time I was on a bunker repairing a, a damage from nighttime um, uh, shelling. Uh, mortars and uh, artillery shells. I was re I was standing on top and it was real foggy. And I was, uh, one of the guys was handing me uh, sandbags and I was distributing them. Well, evidently the fog wasn't strong enough and uh, the 
they spotted me from the enemy line and started shooting at me with a machine gun. And the bullets you could actually hear go by you. And uh, fortunately, uh, they were on either side of me, and the lieutenant was standing in the ditch in the bunker. Uh, and uh, he said, get in here. He said, that they're shooting at you. And so I jumped in, and fortunately, I did get hit. Now, when you first joined the unit, did anybody try to orient you or tell you what to do, or did you just watch and learn by yourself? Nobody told me what to do. I, uh, I was a corporal, mm -hmm. I, and I would uh, I was assigned to uh, as a squad leader. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, the uh, my actual squad leader was a sergeant. But uh, every time a firing started and, and was, he pulled a disappearing act, and uh, never we never saw him until after the firing was done. Okay, and and he, I, so I took over. Right. So he was allowed to get away with that. I mean, well, I didn't say anything, and yeah. I'd be the only one that'd say anything. Mm -hmm. um, and. What were your officers like? Well, our, most of them were non-commissioned, uh, so okay. Yeah, they uh, we did have uh, lieutenants, mm -hmm. and uh, you didn't see them very often. Although the guy that told me to jump mm -hmm. in the trench was a lieutenant, yeah. And uh, we had. Uh, I always had a. Uh, a strong feeling about Southerners, and they, because they, they all sounded like hillbillies to me, and and a lot of these sergeants were hillbillies, mm -hmm. and uh, I just never cared for them, <laughs> right. and that was what made my decision to uh, go to college because I, I decided I wasn't going to be uh, underneath one of those hillbillies again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were not going to re-enlist and stay in the army and yeah, make a career of it. All right. Uh, now you said you didn't you didn't see much of your officers. Now was that because you were so spread out, or because there weren't as many officers as there should have been, or? Well, we didn't have very many officers yeah. other than the sergeants, yeah. and they were in a, just collected together in a, one bunker, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the rest of us were. Uh, were uh, our squad leaders is just we just took care of the rest of it. And did you ever see anything of your company commander, or would he be just in the rear somewhere? Would you see a captain ever? No. Okay. Um, and you, you had mentioned sort of the R and R back to a camp and so forth. Uh, did you get around into any of Korea behind the lines, or were you always up front? I was. Uh, we would uh, go into what they call blocking position, which was right behind the lines, mm -hmm. and there would be another group in our place on the, in the lines, mm -hmm. on the lines, and uh, we'd be uh, right behind them in tents, and uh, it was blocking or yeah. backup. But that's still pretty much yeah. up in the front line sector. Did you have any Koreans working with you? Uh, we did. Uh, the uh, the Korean uh, army was not very efficient, and they decided that uh, you know, they'd have to break them up and uh, put them in our squads. And I had one uh, Korean uh, in my squad that was from the regular army, mm -hmm. but uh, but they uh, they uh, they just weren't they they wouldn't have been able to defend their country. And. Uh, and I wasn't too happy with the one I had. Mm -hmm. Now, could he speak any English, or? I don't remember whether really he did or not. I don't think so. Okay. But he would, did not impress you particularly as a soldier? Yeah, as a soldier, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, and was the period when the Pork Chop Hill fight was going on, was that the most intense period of fighting that you watched, or was it like that a lot? Oh, it was prior to that. Uh, okay. It was just different hills, yeah. but not as long. Mm -hmm. Pork chop lasts a whole week. 
yeah. night and day. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have that in, in other hills. Okay. All right. Uh, and you got there, it would still have been winter. It was what? Was it still winter when you got to the front line? I got to the front lines and there, it was winter and mm -hmm. we had what they call Korean boots, uh, the uh, Mickey Mouse boots. And they, uh, they were issued uh, late in, uh, in the Korean War and uh, I was fortunate enough to get them. The early guys, they had a lot of frostbite in, uh, in frozen toes and so forth and uh, they just didn't have the, uh, the equipment but the, those uh, Korean boots, I still have a pair, but those really keep your feet warm. Mm -hmm. And the Air Force had got uh, white ones, we had black ones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but you had adequate winter gear. We had we had adequate gear, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, when uh, as the uh, through the winter, I mean it was really cold. I mean we it wasn't uh, just mild. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really cold, and and uh, ice and snow, and just like here and. Uh, but uh, then, then we got summer, mm -hmm. and then it got the opposite, mm -hmm. uh, really hot. All right. Now, uh, you're there in kind of the last, you know, five, six months of the war or whatever, the last part of the war before the armistice was signed. Uh, at what point did you start hearing rumors that there might be an armistice, that this might come to an end? Well, we'd heard that periodically. Uh, that they were working on an armistice. And on the day of the armistice, I think you've got a copy of this, uh, on the day of the armistice, the uh, lieutenant did come around and said, uh, uh, they signed the truce agreement uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, but you better take cover until 10 o'clock tonight because uh, they, uh, they'll throw everything they got on it to get rid of it at us and uh, and then of course that's what we did in my case I another guy and myself I, I picked out the slope of a, of a hill and I got on the upper slope close to the ridge to the top and uh, on the opposite side of the enemy and, uh, and I stayed there because I figured when they threw shells they'd go over us mm -hmm. and uh, Highly unlikely it'd land on top of the crest, and uh, so that that got me through mm -hmm. that ten day, uh, ten hours, <laughs> or twelve hours. Okay. So the Chinese were bombarding you and bombarding us with uh, mortars and artillery. Okay. And were we doing the same to them? We were doing the same to them. Okay. So they were just getting rid of their extra ammunition at that point. Well, <laughs> we always had extra ammunition. <laughs> All right. There was brass everywhere. Okay. Now to think over that time that you spent up there on the front lines uh, with the Seventh Division, are there other particular memories that stand out for you that you haven't talked about yet? On the front line. Yeah. Well, I can tell you about some incidents. Yep. Uh, the uh, one particular time I was uh, sitting in a bunker, and uh, I, I had a machine gun. And uh, the uh, it was daylight, and uh, I was just sitting uh, on a kind of a higher, kind of a high stool, and uh, leaning against a post that supported the roof of the uh, bunker, and it was a it was a big post, and uh, some un unusual thing happened that uh, I had a clip of ammunition, it was actually a rifle ammunition, it wasn't um, for the machine gun, but I don't know how it fell on the floor, but I bent, I bent down to pick it up, and just as I did that, a mortar went right off, off and right in front of uh, my aperture, mm -hmm. and the shrapnel came through over my back and stuck in a post like that <laughs> that I was leaning on. I, 
when I got up, I looked at that post, and it was just riddled with shrapnel. Mm -hmm. That's what I was leaning against. Right. But that's okay. one of the incidents that I thought was unusual. Another time, we were uh, uh, digging in a, a trench. We were trying to deepen it or repair it because of the shelling. It, and uh, they unveiled a cannon from a, a tank on the opposite side. They had this veil that they lifted up and re uh, revealed this uh, tank with 91 millimeter uh, uh, cannon. And it started shooting at us. And you could hear those shells come at you just like a freight train. I mean, just screaming at you. And they, they hit on the side of the hill uh, below us and above us and covered us with dirt. And of course, we managed to get out of the area, but they threw several shells at us. As far as I know, nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. And they just cover the tank back up again, or? Then all they do is cover the tank back up. <laughs> all right. Now, did your unit ever try to launch an attack against the Chinese, or did you just patrol? Did what? Did you ever launch a formal attack to try to capture something, or did you just conduct patrols? We always try to capture somebody. Well, no, but to capture a position. You know, it's like they was fighting for pork chops. Well, we were we were in a uh, what they call a um, ambush position. Mm -hmm. We uh, one day we uh, we trained all day for an ambush because they were ambushing us on this hill. Mm -hmm. they, there were uh, five fingers called Jack King Queen or four fingers and you know, and. Uh, this one one particular finger that these are ridges of mm -hmm. uh, of the hill, and one one particular uh, patrol. We trained for uh, patrols to go out on both sides, and then uh, meet in uh, at the end, which where the uh, ambushes were, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, we intended to ambush them, and uh, but. Uh, we made so much noise on the way out that uh, they, they had left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you weren't really trying to secure new territory. You were just. Pardon me? You weren't really trying to secure an area and occupy it. Yeah. You were just basically patrolling and ambushing and counter ambushing and, yeah. and that yeah. kind of So it's really only the Chinese who were trying to move the front line. They were trying to move the front line, right. yeah. Okay. Now, for the most part, were you in. The better defensive position. I mean, if you had gone forward, would it have been hard to stay up there? And were you in were you on higher ground where you were, and then the Chinese had the other high ground, or we we're all both of us yeah. were on high ground. Okay. All right. Okay. So when you finally okay, so you mentioned okay, so you, you have when the news of the armistice comes down, they have the artillery duel for twelve hours or whatever, and then that stops. Uh, and then what did you do? When everything stopped at yeah. 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. it was uh, really uh, ironic. Uh, it, it, uh, I mean, it was just amazing. It just sounded like somebody turned the water off, a big heavy faucet, you know, and just like it turned off and all of a sudden it was quiet. And then lights came on mm -hmm. on both sides of the... Uh, enemy side and our side. Mm -hmm. We turned on truck lights and they turned on truck lights and uh, and uh, flashlights and candles and uh, it was uh, it was amazing. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, spoke in English on a microphone to come on over we're going to have a party and uh, and of course, uh, that was we weren't in <laughs> that kind of a party, and supposedly, and I I can't verify this. Supposedly, two guys went over there, and uh, they, when they got back, they got court martialed by our side. But they did get to come back. They did get to come back. Yeah. Okay. So, how long did you stay in those positions after the armistice? 
Oh, not very long. We went into a blocking position mm -hmm. uh, and stayed in that in a tent in blocking position. And there were always two men to a tent. You had a half a shelter a piece that you always carried, and uh, and you button them together. And, uh, and then two guys uh, would stay in uh, those uh, shelter. And I thought I'd go home right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I gave my air, air mattress to my bunk partner, and, uh, or my tent partner, and uh, I ended up by staying another month. <laughs> he was sleeping on my air mattress. <laughs> now why did you assume that you would get to leave early? Well, I'd spent enough time over there. Yeah. Well, you'd been overseas, too. You'd been in Japan yeah, for yeah. a year and a half already. I figured so. I was due for... Uh, to go home. Okay. Now, were there men who regularly rotated out of your unit during the time you were with it? There were guys rotated out from time to time, yeah. 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 Okay. And so, by the time you finished, uh, were most of the guys new guys, or were you still serving with the guys you had been serving with? Did I? I well, but at the end of at the end of your time in Korea with the Seventh Division. Were the men in your platoon or squad pretty much the same ones you had all along, or were most of them new? Well, that changed, but a lot of them stayed. Okay. All right. Uh, now, did you stay in that sector until it was time to leave? Well, eventually, uh, uh, we got transferred uh, down to Pusan, okay. as the bottom of the mm -hmm. Korea. And uh, and uh, we were to get on a ship at that point, and uh, so we spent 17 days on a ship, uh, getting back to uh, the United okay. States, and uh, that was we went through the tropical cancer, and the ship that was rougher, a son of a gun, and everybody on the ship was sick mm -hmm. except for me, and I was trying to avoid that, and uh, I'd even. Uh, stay on the front of the ship and stay out of the puke areas because they're puking on the stairs and in the in a, uh, in a cafeteria and every place and uh, I'd stay on the front. I remember one time I was I was just hanging on the side of the railing and, and one guy up up wind of me he said like this get, so I ducked back and this guy threw, puked and, and got the next guy past me. <laughs> uh, which is uh, obviously uh, not fun. Yeah. How did they get you from the front lines down to Pusan? They took us by train. Okay. And do you remember anything about the Korean countryside that you went through? The countryside was uh, mostly agriculture mm -hmm. and, and mostly shacks, even uh, even. Uh, I mean, the big cities mm -hmm. were mostly shacks to me. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of it. So, so it still looked pretty poor, basically. Hmm? It looked pretty poor? Like Very people, poor. People were... Okay. Uh, did you have much contact with any of the Koreans, aside from your Korean soldier, or...? No. Okay. None. All right. Okay. So you, so you leave Korea 17 days across the ocean. Uh, where did you land in the States? Los Angeles. Is that where Alcatraz is? That's San Francisco. San Francisco. That's where we landed. San okay. Francisco. All right. And when you got Golden there... Golden Gate Bridge. Right. I remember right. that. Right. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then what did they do with you once you arrived? Well, we got on a train, or not an airplane. And we, we flew back to... Uh, I flew back to Detroit, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, then I hitchhiked from Detroit back to Ann Arbor, and uh, in the meantime, I hadn't uh, written my folks in a long time. There wasn't any source of uh, mail, and uh, so they were kind of surprised to see me. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> now, were you on leave at that point? I was on leave. Yeah, I had 30 days, and then, I, then we had to go back to Fort Sheridan, and then the rest is history. Okay. Uh, so when you go back to Fort Sheridan, what did you do? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> we uh, uh, 
some of uh, some of the guys and myself would go downtown Chicago and uh, go to some favorite bars where they would you'd buy a couple of drinks. They'd, get, they'd buy one, you one, and, mm -hmm. and, and we'd kind of hang out in places like that. All right. So was that the kind of thing where you show up for roll call in the morning and then you're on your own, or did they give you any jobs? We were, there were some guys that were assigned to uh, jobs, mm -hmm. uh, but I somehow, I, uh, I didn't have any. Okay. I never had any. All right. And when did you get to Fort Sheridan? When what? When did you arrive at Fort Sheridan? Well, that would have been in uh, probably September okay. or October. All right. Of, uh, 53 at that point. 53. All right. Uh, and then uh, how did your service time come to an end? Well, I was there uh, long enough uh, to uh, finally, uh, I said, I'm, you know, I just, I'm not doing anything. So I went into the, one of the officers and uh, I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to re-enlist and, and I'm going to go to college. And there's no point in keeping me here because there's no place to send me for a short period of time. Yeah. So why don't you just discharge me? And they did. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, at what point did you decide that you were going to go to college? Is that why you're still well, back? I already decided that in the service um, after uh, being underneath those. It was, uh, okay. <laughs> so it was the experience of being in Korea with those sergeants that... So you made that choice. Had you applied to a college by then, or no? Okay. No, I uh, I uh, lived in Ann Arbor, and I went down to uh, which is Eastern Michigan University mm -hmm. now, Ypsilanti Normal yeah. at that time. Yeah. And uh, I told them I wanted to go to school, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, lady that uh, was in charge of whoever I was talking to, she uh, she said, well, I had to bring my high school mm -hmm. grades, and she said, well, your grades aren't very good. I says, well, I still want to go to college. She says, well, because you're a veteran, we'll, we'll let you in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she let me in, and I went to one semester at the Ypsilanti Normal, or, uh, and then I decided to transfer to Michigan State because they had a, a boxing uh, team up there. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, that was the only one in the state of Michigan that had a boxing team. And, uh, so I, and then they also had a veterinary medicine school, which I was interested in getting mm -hmm. into veterinary medicine. So uh, I went to Michigan, I transferred to Michigan State I went out for the boxing team and, and I didn't do well in veterinary medicine school because I was a poor so a poor student in mm -hmm. the first place. So I uh, ended up by transferring out of that and eventually uh, getting into education. And uh, so I got my degree in education and uh, eventually my master's degree and just short of my doctoral. Okay. Now, when you, so you trained to be a teacher, uh, did you become a teacher then? I did. Okay, and what, what subjects did you teach or what grades did you teach? I, well, I first uh, first taught in uh, Oxford, uh, Michigan, which was, uh, I taught uh, general science at that time. I taught a couple of years to, uh, I think they were eighth or ninth graders, and, uh, and I taught a couple of years there, and then I transferred up to, uh, Seaboying, uh, I, I, I had gotten my master's by that time in guidance and counseling, mm -hmm. and I got a job setting up a counseling program up in uh, Seaboying. So, no, uh, can, we, you, can you spell that? Seaboying? Yeah. S E B Wing, W I N G. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Whoever transcribes this interview later will appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Because they'll never hear it. Okay. All right. So, you're going into counseling at that point. Yeah. I, I, it was, I was the uh, counselor there, and uh, uh, we felt, I mostly my wife felt that the town was pretty small and mm -hmm. we needed to 
transfer somewhere else. So we, uh, I, I, uh, we looked into uh, Michigan State's uh, file of jobs, which they had tons of them mm -hmm. for teachers at that time because they didn't pay them anything. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, we could have gotten a job in Hawaii, Los Angeles. Uh, uh, we finally decided we wanted to Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, to, to go back to Michigan. And there, there were two places in Michigan we were interested in, one in Traverse City and one that was here. And uh, this was the better paying of the two, so we came here. Okay, so when did you start in Grand Haven? Uh, in, in 19, well, we, when we transferred to here yeah. to Grand Haven, we came in 1961. Uh, okay. And then did you continue as, a, we were a high school counselor or a teacher, or what were you? I went into the counseling right away, okay. yeah. and then uh, eventually uh, I uh, got out of counseling and then went to my my, uh, my major, which was uh, speech education, mm -hmm. and I taught speech for the rest of the time. Well, I was here for 25 years. Okay. Now, uh, another piece of your background uh, is you became something of an environmental activist. Uh, oh, yeah. And you were yeah, a member well, of... Well, uh, we, we uh, lived in a little in a, a duplex uh, in where the library is right now mm -hmm. in, uh, on Comstock, and right adjacent to the city uh, park. And at that time, they had a lot of elm trees around town. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were constantly spraying them with DDT. And uh, we looked up this DDT, and uh, in fact, I read, uh, Barbara read it first, uh, Silent Spring. And uh, then I read it, and I said, I got, we got to do something about this DDT business. So, because uh, we had kids, you know, and, and uh, and uh, we also could see the robins dying in the park. And uh, so I started going to the city council and uh, talking about DDT and how lethal it was and explaining that uh, they, what they were doing was spraying uh, the uh, bark, but the beetles were underneath the bark that were killing the tree and they were not getting to the beetles. And so they were just wasting a, a lot of money on on DDT and uh, contaminating the area, which would eventually uh, flow into the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for every council meeting for three years. Wow. And uh, they finally got tired of seeing me, I guess. And uh, they, and I guess they did some research on their own. They had brought in agriculture people, mm -hmm. and I'd argue with them. They would argue for DDT, and uh, I mean, I did have my facts because yeah. I did a lot of reading, right. and uh, and uh, they uh, they brought in everybody they could, and uh, they finally gave up, and uh, they decided to go to a non-residual pesticide, mm -hmm. which was methoxychlor, and which is what I recommended. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they actually said, uh, well, we're going to switch. Mm -hmm. So they switched to that. And I said, well, you know, the, the poison is the same. It's not going to get to the beetle. So you might as well quit altogether. Mm -hmm. So they did. And uh, then I thought, well, I'll go to Spring Lake and talk to those people about it. And I don't remember how that came out, but uh, I did. And then uh, I decided to uh, start a environmental action council in uh, in Lansing, in East Lansing, which is where there were an awful lot of very knowledgeable people, a lot um, of professors right. and doctorals, and uh, and uh, we got a lot of people on the on our committee mm -hmm. that volunteered to to be on the committee, and uh, I was elected chairman of the tri or the uh, Michigan Environmental Action Council, and we had meetings once a month, 
Barbara and I would uh, go to Lansing. Uh, she had her family there and she would visit with them while I would go to the meetings. And uh, eventually that committee was strong enough. And they, I mean, they had really good people on it. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, petitioned the, uh, the federal government and in and, and, uh, pursuing the same thing to quit mm -hmm. using there were 10 actually, uh, 10 types of uh, residuals mm -hmm. that uh, lasted a lot, on, on infinitum. DDT was just one. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, got, they got them to ban all of them. How long did that take? A long time. <laughs> I can't remember the year that we, they finally, uh, the federal government finally quit. And, uh, but that was a big breakthrough because it was affecting, uh, we didn't realize it at the time, but it was affecting eagles. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, their eggs, eggs would crack from the DDT, right. and uh, so they weren't getting any young, and uh, the, D, uh, the uh, eagle population went way down. And of course others too, peregrines mm -hmm. and, and uh, ospreys. and, and uh, shorebirds and mm -hmm. so forth and just all kinds of things that ate fish and uh, other uh, marine type of food and uh, it affected them all and then all of a sudden they started coming back uh, when that was mm -hmm. all banned. To this day uh, they're really prevalent. Yeah, oh, my. I live on a small lake and we have eagles and ospreys and yeah. all that kind of thing there. I did other things besides that, I mean, uh, for environment. I, uh, I wrote a, uh, a burning uh, ordinance for the city of Grand Haven mm -hmm. that uh, the, keep, uh, they would burn leaves, you know, right down the street. Sure. And, uh, uh, it was a burning ordinance, and uh, which they adopted, the city adopted, and uh, so you couldn't burn leaves on the street anymore. I wasn't real popular as, as a result <laughs> of that, but uh, the, uh, there were numerous things that I, I did along that line. All right, uh, yeah, because and then um, you eventually got recognized for that. Your, yeah. What? Yeah, I got a, I got a. Uh, a trophy over there for uh, I was uh, indoctrinated into the Michigan Hall of Fame, Environmental Hall mm -hmm. of Fame, right. and uh, the uh, you know, very uh, other organizations also have recognized me. All the or, or all the business organizations had me speak to them mm -hmm. in town. So eventually, that got more popular. Yeah. People realize, yeah, the environment matters and we sure. can do something. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, kind of to close out here, uh, when you think back about your time in the service, uh, how do you think that affected you or what did you learn from it? Well, one thing, a discipline, you, you uh, learn that right away. It's too bad they don't indoctrinate everybody into the service temporarily and, and get them, teach them discipline. And uh, it wouldn't even have to go into the military, but that would make a lot of difference for these young whippersnappers. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I, uh, done very well here, I think. I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to share your story today.